Thank you, Jen. And please uh, do have your Bibles open in front of you to Romans chapter uh, 13. Romans chapter 13, as we uh, continue our series uh, in the book of Romans, uh, and this time reaching the very topical uh, subject which Ollie's going to be taking us through of how we relate to our government in this day and age, and also how we relate to neighbours as well. But let's uh, turn to it's page 1140. Uh, in the Church Bibles, uh, Romans chapter 13. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and he will commend you. For he is God's servant to do you good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword for nothing. He is God's servant, an agent of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also because of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants who give, you, who give their full time to governing. Give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Let no debt remain outstanding except a continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. The commandments do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and whatever other commandments there may be are summed up in this one. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And do this understanding the present time. The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber, because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy, Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. Please turn with me uh, back to Romans 13 if you've lost your page. Uh, Romans 13. Good morning, everyone. Great to see you all this morning. Let me add my welcome to Steve's. Let me, let me give a special welcome to the Year Sixes who are with us as well this morning. It's great to have you in the church here today. So as Steve said, they'll be joining GIG going forward, so we'll be spending half their time in the service over the next term and half in the Sunday groups. Well, the government, we're thinking about authority this morning, the government can be a bit like Marmite. You either love them or loathe them, right? <laughs> How do you feel about authority? As long as I can get away with it and I'm not hurting anyone else, then what's the problem? That tends to be what you might hear or the attitude of some people. I wonder, what do you think of when you see this sign? Hmm. Do you think 80 miles per hour? <laughs> Do you think, where are the speed cameras? Do you think, I need to watch out for police? Why, why can cars in the UK go faster than 70 miles per hour? <laughs> I wonder how many of us use a mobile phone without being hands-free when driving? People do everywhere. You see them every time you're out. Young people, do you ever see your parents or grandparents doing these things? 
It's rhetorical, don't answer. <laughs> so I was driving yesterday, running late. What's the temptation when you're running late? It's to go a bit faster. I then needed some directions, and my phone wasn't responding to my voice. The temptation to pick it up. As individuals, we are blessed with much freedom, with much power. But with great power comes great responsibility. The responsibility of Christians to behave well in society is huge. It's absolutely huge. And it's even harder when illegal activities are accepted so readily in society. Living through a pandemic has reminded us of that. However, we absolutely want law and order. Of course we do. We definitely want justice. If someone does something terrible, like kill someone else, we want them to be punished. And in view of God's mercy... Paul wants believers to behave well, to be godly in their behavior. And so we come to the government, the authority over us. So firstly, believers are to behave well by submitting to the authority. Verse 1 of chapter 13 says, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities. Now it's worth saying that on the whole this passage seems to be about the governing authorities. It mentions tax, it mentions revenue. That trickles down to local council and the police. Other passages do mention wider authority such as employers. But our passage is more on the state authority. So verse 1, be subject to the governing authorities. Why? For there is no authority except that which God has established. They are put there by God. And notice that verse 1 repeats this. For there is no authority except that which God has established. Full stop. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Now, if I was sitting where you are in the congregation, questions would start to arise already in my mind about this passage. It's a hard passage. Hold those thoughts, and we'll hopefully cover, cover some of them as we go along. Verse 2 goes on. Whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against God. God has put the authority in place. You rebel against them. You rebel against God. And there are consequences. Now, we we know that every day, don't we? If you don't do as the government says, then, of course, there are consequences. If you steal, there are consequences. If you hurt someone else, there are consequences. If you drive dangerously, then God uses the authority to carry out his judgment. You'll be fined, or worse, imprisoned. Verse 4 says, if you do wrong, be afraid. For the authorities or rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. Now, without getting into the nitty-gritty of what exactly Paul meant by the sword, what the language certainly means is that they carry out God's judgment. They are used by God in this way. And verse 4 continues, and it gets even stronger. Paul calls them agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. They are God's servants, agents of wrath, to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. We we sometimes think about God's wrath 
We do that on a Sunday morning. But to think that every time justice is carried out, that that is God's wrath, it's not really something we think about that often. We might wonder how we see that in our society. And what we need to remember about God's wrath is that it is good, it is just, and it is a settled response. It is not flying off the the handle in anger. So just think what that means. Every fine, every criminal record, every imprisonment is God's wrath. Verse 5 continues. It is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of fear of punishment, that of judgment and wrath, but also because of what? As a matter of conscience. Because it's the right godly thing to do. Now let me ask, if you profess to be a follower of Jesus, then how do you view the governing authorities? What words would you use to describe the governing authorities? Careful. Notice that three times in these verses, these seven verses, they are called, wait for it, God's servants. Twice in verse 4, they're God's servants for your good. They're God's servants, agents of wrath. And verse 6, they're God's servants who give their full time to governing. Well, that raises their profile a little bit. Significantly, I would suggest. How should we treat someone who the Bible says is a servant of God? Well, as good as possible, I would suggest. Paul is saying we do not simply behave properly and in in accordance with the law just because there is a threat of punishment. No, we do so because our conscience convicts us and tells us it is the most godly thing to do and honouring to him. The authorities are his servants and therefore how we treat them is how we treat God. And that's challenging. And now we may be thinking, but what about really bad and corrupt governments? Well, as God's servants, they will have to stand before him and give an account. But remember Warwick preaching two weeks ago on the earlier bit from Romans 12. Chapter 12, verse 17. We are not to repay anyone evil for evil. Chapter 12, verse 19, we do not take revenge, but leave room for God's wrath. It is not our job to bring judgment on God's servant. But we can have absolute confidence that all will be made right in the end. Now, of course, we don't read chapter 13 of Romans in isolation. We have the whole Bible. We know this passage is not the whole picture. Our passage is clearly speaking in broad terms this morning. So consider other passages to bear in mind. If the authority tells us to worship idols, then we know that's wrong from Daniel chapter 3. If the authority tells us to pray to the authority or the king... We know from Daniel chapter 6, that is wrong. If the authority tells us to take another life, the midwives in Exodus 1 save babies. They save life. If the authority tells us to ignore people who are hungry, we know that Jesus himself defied the Jewish authority when his disciples were hungry on the Sabbath. And if we're told not to tell other people about Jesus, 
Then Peter and the apostles in Acts chapter 5 obey God and not man. They share the good news. But Jesus does submit. When teaching on tax, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Jesus even acknowledges that the Roman governor Pilate is under his father's authority at his crucifixion. Jesus knows there is an authority in place at the worst time of his life. But let's be honest, this is complicated, isn't it? Consider Christians living in Russia, where their taxes go to the governing authority, which is fueling war. Goodness, that is hard, isn't it? But Putin will be judged, and he will face God's wrath. It's our democratic right to protest in this country. We're allowed to do that. When we're not happy about things, we're allowed to protest. But that is illegal in so many other countries, and they're not allowed to do that. That's hard. And it's worth us adding some weight to the passage by remembering the context in which Paul is writing this morning. Who was most likely the Roman emperor at the time that Paul writes? It's Emperor Nero, a guy who disposed of people at his pleasure. He murdered his own mum, and he goes on to murder two wives. He encouraged pagan worship, temples, statues, images himself. He persecuted Christians. They were torn by dogs, even burnt. People believed that he would return to life as the Antichrist. The guy likely to be in charge, as Paul writes to these believers and tells them to obey, is simply horrendous. So living today as a believer in Afghanistan or in North Korea, you're probably close to the situation. And yet Paul still writes these things to the church. And so reflecting on that, aren't we hugely privileged to have the government that we do? Other countries are desperate for the protection, the provision, and the democracy that we enjoy. Well, the application is is fairly easy. Be thankful and obey the law within the boundaries that I've just said. Obey the governing authority, whether at home, whether in the car, whether in your business dealings, with your taxes. Ever thought of HMRC as being God's servants? Probably not. Because when we don't, it's not just the earthly authority we disobey, it's the heavenly authority too. This section of Romans started, remember, back in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is hard. The pattern of this world where we live is so often to speak badly about the authority. Every week I hear someone Uh, or I read something critical or negative or anti-government. We don't like the authority. Our culture on the whole is anti-authority. But as we've said, we need it. We really don't want to live in a society without it. We need law and order, yet we complain and we speak badly about it. How as believers are we being transformed by the renewing of our minds? By speaking well of the governing authorities, 
and submitting to their rule under God. Verse 7 of our passage says we are to show respect. It says show honour. Remember, they are God's servants. For every time we live or speak in an anti-authoritarian manner, we speak against God. So firstly, we behave well as believers by submitting to the government. And secondly, following very closely, we are to love our neighbour. How we live as citizens of this country should be with an attitude of love to those whom God puts around us. Everyone. Our neighbour is anyone around us each day. So it might be your schoolmates. It might be other children or young people. It might be your teachers or your work colleagues. The person waiting with you at the bus stop. It might be your cleaner who comes in. It could be the prime delivery woman or the postman. In our passage, a few commands are given as examples of loving your neighbour. But the key words are in verse 9. Look at verse 9 with me. Halfway through, and whatever other command there may be. In all laws and commands, we are to love your neighbour. So we are to love and protect our friends, marriages and relationships. We are to love and give thanks for what other people have. We are to love and be content with what God has given us. We are to love life and to cherish it greatly. We're to be pro-life, because love does no harm to anyone. And and did you notice what verse 8 says? Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. The love we show can never be enough. We all get the principle of debt. So if I promise to give my son and my daughter five pounds pocket money a week and then miss four weeks, then I'm in debt to them by 20 pounds. And yes, they remind me of that quickly. But if I pay the 20 pounds debt, I've cleared it. It's gone. Not so with love. You are always in debt. You always owe more love. Whether we might show love by sharing your home, cooking a meal, giving someone flowers, taking someone to the hospital or out for a coffee, helping a friend at school. We love in so many ways, but we can always love more. And we know that is true because of God's love towards us in Christ Jesus. Paul earlier in Romans chapter 5 said, God shows his love towards us. That extravagant and never-ending love in that while we were still far off, even enemies, Christ died for us. God's love is is deeper than we can possibly imagine. It will never run dry. Therefore, neither should our love. It's a continuous debt towards our neighbours. Love your neighbour. And finally, we do all of this. We behave like this, submitting to the authority, loving others, being ready for Christ's return. That is our ultimate motivation for living godly lives. We are waiting for the return of our King. Every day we live a a day closer to Christ coming back, 
Today is a day closer than yesterday to our Lord returning. Verse 11 says, salvation is nearer than when we first believed. So we are to be awake. We are to be alert and ready. Verse 12 says, the night is coming to an end. The day is nearly here. So choose to live and behave as children of the light, putting on the armour of light. Verse 13 says, let us behave decently as in the daytime. When you think of things that, that might happen at night, then I'm sure things, as the passage says, such as drunkenness and sexual immorality are quite high. If we spoke to one of the street pastors here at the church, I'm sure they could open our eyes to some of the nighttime activity in Derby. Rather, we, as followers of Jesus, live in the day, clothing ourselves in the Lord Jesus Christ. And something that we, we all have in common, whether young or old, is that we all get dressed every day. We understand the picture of putting clothes on really easily. Thankfully, we all wear clothes. We get up in the morning, we put our clothes on, and it covers us. It makes us presentable for the day. And the interesting thing, wait for it, it's deep, about putting our clothes on, is that where we go, they come too. Our clothes come with us. Where we are to clothe ourselves with Jesus. Yes, we've already put on Christ. We are righteous before God. That was Romans 6. But there is a sense in our passage that this is also something we do every day. It's a daily task. We wake up, we get dressed, and we be ready. We are to put off the works of darkness and put on the Lord Jesus Christ. We put Jesus on every day. And then remember that he too is with us wherever we go. Think about that every time you get dressed. We mustn't slumber We mustn't sleep. If we belong to the day, then we live according to the day. And if we do that, and we need the Spirit to help us, then our desire will not be for the flesh or to live in sinful ways. It will be to love those around us. We will want to love our neighbours. And we will want to submit and speak to the authorities, speak well of the authorities that we live under. The day, we're told, is nearly here. So let's live as God commands. Let's pray. Let's just be quiet for a few moments as we reflect on God's word to us this morning. Maybe think about how you view the government, but what the Bible says about them being God's servants. Or maybe think about neighbours, those you see each week who you could love even more this week. Father, your word is so challenging. We recognize that it is hard when we live in a society that seems to be so anti-authority. Yet your call upon us is high to live as you call us to. Please help us to be good witnesses for you, we pray. 
Please help us to love and for that love to overflow our neighbours and all those you put around us each week. And we pray that we would never forget that the day is drawing nearer, that you are coming back, and that we do these things as we wait with eager anticipation of your return. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen.